my very first job in ministry was as a part-time youth pastor at a church in Glen Ellen while I was finishing seminary. Now, I'd grown up in the church and grown up around ministry, but this was my first time actually doing the ministry myself, so I had to learn a lot. And so I depended on guys who were a little more experienced in youth ministry to learn from, and I read a lot of magazines about youth ministry. And one of the ideas that was sort of sweeping churches in our country back in those days was something called a planned famine. This was an event that you... Uh, took students away for like 24 hours, locked them in the church building, and gave them nothing to eat except rice and water. The idea was to teach them something about world hunger by experiencing just a little bit of it, just 24 hours, and I thought it was a great idea. I'd been to parts of the world where I'd seen the developing world, and I thought, great, I'll do that, plan famine. But then I decided to sort of take it up a notch. I decided uh, instead of giving the students... Uh, water and rice for 24 hours, I decided, what, I, I don't want to make the rice. I'll give them nothing. They can survive for 24 hours. So a true famine. And I didn't even have a recipe for rice. So how was I going to make rice? So I decided that. And then I decided, secondly, that I was going to surprise them, that, that I wasn't going to tell them it was a planned famine. Anybody see anything wrong here? Any problem? <laughs> so all the students showed up. They each brought like two pounds of Skittles and junk food and Mountain Dew and stuff, which is what they do along with their sleeping bags. So the first thing I did was I confiscated all the junk food. That didn't go very well. Then I told them, surprise, this is a, a famine. You're not going to have anything to eat for 24 hours. You would have thought, well, I was going to waterboard them all weekend, right? They, one kid broke into my office and tried to use my phone so we could call to the outside world to have pizza smuggled in. Somebody else broke a window to climb out of it, to, to escape. They tried to escape my event so they could go across the street and buy Snickers bars at the, um, at the drugstore right across the street. So it was a disaster. It was an unplanned disaster. I learned a couple things from that experience. First of all, I learned not to surprise people in ministry. And secondly, I learned that, and I actually eventually learned this through my own sons, but I learned that high school students, when they get hungry, are dangerous. We see that in this story, I think. I'm going to summarize some for you. We are in a series called Wonderings. As we're working our way through the story of God, Genesis, and Exodus, we're about two-thirds of the way through the great book of Exodus, and we're talking about uh, the people wandering around in the desert. Now, let me just give you some background. Remember the story of the Passover when they uh, made the exodus from Egypt because they put the blood of the lamb over the doorposts and the angel of death passed over the Hebrew homes, bringing death to the, to the Egyptian firstborn sons. And then we saw the miraculous crossing in the Red Sea when God parted the waters. The people of Israel went through on dry ground. Then last week, Jeff jumped ahead to the giving of the law, had the two signs up here, and he talked about how the God giving the law actually leads us to understanding the importance and significance of the grace of Christ in the New Testament, which is why we're doing this whole series from the Old Testament. But today we're going to go backwards just a bit, a couple of chapters. We're going to pick up the story after they've crossed the Red Sea, but before the giving of the law. This is about 30 days or so after they've crossed the Red Sea. Let me pick up the story at Exodus chapter 16. And I'll read it for you. They set out from Elim, and all the congregation of the people of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, or Sin. And that doesn't mean sin like we say it. That's just a place in the ancient Middle East. Which is between Elam and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had departed from the land of Egypt. So it's roughly 30 to 40 days after they've crossed the sea. And the whole congregation of the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the people of Israel said to them, would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat down by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I'm going to stop there. The first thing we see in this part of this ancient story is the people grumble. They grumble. Now this word um, that's translated into English as grumble is a very interesting Hebrew word. It's only used several times in the Old Testament, and it means to to gripe, to murmur against, to complain, to bellyache. Anybody here ever? I'm sure none of you have ever bellyached about something. Usually it's about someone in authority over us. It could be a boss, uh, a teacher, a coach, a parent, and we grumble, we murmur against when we don't get what we think we deserve, when we're not being treated the way we want to be treated, when we can't control the situation, and we grumble especially as human beings when we're tired and hungry. Uh, years ago, 
Uh, I had a chance to lead a short-term mission team to Bolivia in South America with a bunch of college and ex-college athletes, basketball players. Um, we were going to play a bunch of games all around this country of Bolivia. While uh, get, every chance we got, we were going to encourage believers in the church and share the gospel, which we did. It was just an unforgettable experience. Bolivia is a breathtaking country. Most of you have not been there. It's beautiful. There's mountains. There's lakes. There's deserts. There's rainforest. It's just a, a breathtaking small country. But it's also breathtaking in poverty. I think still the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere behind Haiti. So we saw, had amazing experiences, and we traveled the last... Um, week of the trip, we spent about four days in a row in what's called the Altiplano region of Bolivia. This is the high arid mountain region, about 10,000 feet above sea level, um, cold even in the middle of the day because the air is thin, salt mines, um, the towns inhabited almost entirely by indigenous Indians, the Quechua Indians, so many of the people there had never even seen a person from North America before. So it's just an amazing experience. Um, but we didn't... Um, we, we traveled in kind of rough conditions. We played games in the evening, then we got on an all-night train, would ride to the next community, often we still with our uniforms on, no showers, had some food to eat, uh, water sometimes wasn't trustworthy, so we'd drink Coke and Fanta Orange. For some reason, you can always find Fanta Orange in South America, but we ate, drank a lot of Fanta Orange. So after three days or so, the guys are tired and a little grumpy, you know, and so we get to the last game, and after the game, they said, before your last train ride, we're going to give you dinner at this hotel. Oh, great. It's gonna be, we were hoping maybe, for, maybe we'd get steaks or something like that. So we played the game. Guys, we get them to this um, restaurant, and all the food's prepared for us, all on the table, and each plate's covered with a little napkin. And we pulled the napkins away. It wasn't steak. And they did the best they could to feed us, but it wasn't steak. It was cold scrambled eggs with what looked like little Bolivian hot dogs chopped up inside. Just a small plate of cold scrambled eggs. We were expecting, hoping for steak. And I'll never forget, the guy, one of my dear friends, um, he's a pastor today, about 6'5", 210 pounds. He was hungry and tired and grumpy. And he looked at the plate of cold scrambled eggs, and he just pushed it away and said with the most forlorn attitude, I can't eat this. And he just put his head down on the table like that, like a five-year-old. That was his way of grumbling. We see that here in the story. The people grumble. They're about 30 days out into their great adventure of glorious freedom. Enough time has gone by now that they've exhausted the supply of food they carried with them out of Egypt. About 30 days. And they're starting to get hungry. They're realizing they're running out of food. Furthermore, they realize they're nowhere near the promised land. Remember, they've gone in the wrong direction. They've gone south instead of east. And they begin to grumble. They're like, can you get this guy Moses? You believe this guy Moses? He brings us out here. He's got, he's got no plan. He's got no plan to feed us. My children are hungry. What are we going to eat? We're going to die here in the wilderness. They're grumbling. They're murmuring against. They're belly aching. Listen again. Would that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the meat pots and ate bread to the full. For you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Now this is the second time they've grumbled against Moses. The first time was when they were trapped against the Red Sea with the mountains and the, and the armies of Pharaoh coming after them. They said, we, we would have rather been serving the Egyptians than dying here in the wilderness. This time, they say, would, it would have been better had the Lord killed us himself in Egypt rather than you kill us by hunger out here. Do you know what they're saying? They're actually saying, they're referring, I think, to the Passover. It would have been better for us if we didn't put the blood of lamb over our door frames. And the angel of death would have just taken us then. Can you imagine? They say at least in Egypt we had meat pots. That doesn't sound good to me, but to them it sounded good. Plenty of bread. Really? They make Egypt sound like it was a club med vacation. They were miserable. They were slaves. Pharaoh killed their children. Now they're free. They're no longer slaves. They've experienced the salvation of their God through the blood of the lamb. They've been delivered through the sea through a miracle. But it's been 30 days. And they're hungry. And they grumble. I want you to notice a couple things here. Notice they misremember the past. They remember Egypt as the good old days. A pastor named Tim Keller calls this the language of addiction. Here's what he means. When God saves us, by the grace of Christ, we'll talk about that in a few moments. When he saves us, he saves us out of something, out of bondage to sin and death, and for something, his promise for us. But he always wants us to leave something behind when he saves us into this new life. We leave behind old habits. We leave behind old masters. 
But sometimes along the way, it gets hard, and it gets difficult, and we are tempted to, oh, maybe it wasn't so bad back there. Maybe I'll just go back for a little bit. It's a language of addiction. Notice they also forget who they are. They are no longer slaves to Pharaoh. They are sons and daughters of the king of the universe, Yahweh. I am that I am. They've been delivered by the blood of the lamb, but they forget who they are. And thirdly, they forget who God is. They forget what he's already done. They forget what he's promised to do. And listen, here's the truth. All sin, that is, all the destructive patterns we have of thinking and behaving in our lives, begin with forgetting who God is and forgetting who we are in Christ. All sin begins with forgetting those two things. As I read this passage a couple weeks ago in preparing, I just realized these people, ancient as they are, different as they are, are just so much like us. Isn't that true? We know that God has saved us by his grace. We know that in Christ we have new hearts through the forgiveness of sin. We have new identity. We've been made his sons and daughters. We receive new purpose and new, new uh, destiny. We know all this through the power and truth of the gospel. We celebrated Easter, the resurrection of Christ just a few weeks ago. But then, one way or the other, we find ourselves in the wilderness of our lives. Maybe the wilderness of pain or illness, disease. The, illness, the, the, the wilderness of job loss or financial trouble. The wilderness of conflict. The wilderness of depression or loneliness. And before long, we, we begin to murmur in our hearts. Does God really know? Does he care what's happening to me? What's he doing in my life? I don't see it. And that's a good question. What is God up to at this part of the story? Why the wilderness? Why the desert? Doesn't he know no food grows in the desert? This is a whole bunch of people. How are they going to eat? Does God know what's going on? Well, here's what God is doing. He's still saving his people. He's still delivering them from their slavery because God knows he can take the people out of slavery. But it's much more difficult to take the slavery out of people. See, I think he's taking them on a spiritual journey of rebirth and growing them toward maturity. We see this theme throughout the Bible, especially in the New Testament. Consider these words from James in the New Testament. He says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, when you're in the wilderness. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. The Bible's telling us that depth of faith, depth of maturity, often develops through the wilderness of our lives. We are saved, we are delivered, and then we grow into our salvation. So that's the first thing we see, the people grumble in the wilderness. The second thing we see in the story is that God is gracious. The people grumble, but God is gracious. When I was about 10 years old, 10, 11 or so, uh, my family lived about 40 miles north of New York City. And every summer, my dad would take us boys down to Yankee Stadium a couple times to see our heroes play ball. I got to see Mickey Mantle and Bobby Richardson and Whitey Ford and all those guys in the 60s. And what my dream was was to catch a foul ball at the ballpark to have an actual Major League Baseball. Every boy wants to do that when he goes to the ballpark. So one time I convinced my dad to take us down to the stadium early enough so we could see batting practice. Now you have to go like two hours before the game to do this. Uh, and I figured it was my best chance because the stadium would be empty, they'd be hitting balls, maybe I could get one. That was my plan. So we get down to the ballpark and I run out to the outfield to try to catch a ball. Sure enough, I'm there like two minutes. Like the first guy who was hitting hit a ball into the stands and it was right over there like before that front pew, 15 feet from me, it was right there. I could see the ball, but there was a railing right here that said no spectators beyond this point. Just a railing, but I could see the ball. So I looked around, and I jumped over the railing, ran, got the ball, stuffed it in my pocket, jumped back over the railing, and there was an usher standing right there. I have no idea where he came from. An ancient-looking man, like he had been there when Babe Ruth was there. This ancient-looking usher. And he looked at me, and he said, what you got in your pocket, kid? Because he could see the, the ball in my pocket. And I knew he had me, red-handed. He was going to take the ball and send me to kid jail somewhere in New York City. <laughs> Took the ball out. He said, so you got yourself a ball, huh? You didn't read that sign there? Yes, sir. And you jumped over the rail and got the ball, huh? And I held it out to him. Then he winked at me. And he said, why don't you hop back over there and get yourself another one? Took me completely by surprise. I didn't expect that grace 
at that time. I still have that ball somewhere at our house. We see that here in the story, Exodus 16, 9. Listen to this verse. Then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your grumbling. Evidently, God has good hearing. You ever have a teacher like that in school who you found out could hear better than you thought? You know, you're talking with your friends in the back of the class, and the teacher goes, Oh, Mr. Coffee, you have something you want to share with the class? You know, do you think this is good news or bad news? God says, Tell the people to come near. I've heard their grumbling. Is that good or bad? Should they be really happy or really afraid? Verse 10. And as soon as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the people of Israel, they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. Uh Uh-oh. And the Lord said to Moses, I have heard the grumbling of the people of Israel. Uh Uh-oh. Say to them, at twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread. Then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Wow, that's not what I expected. Couldn't see that coming. What had Pharaoh done when they had grumbled to Pharaoh chapters ago? Well, he punished them. He said, make me bricks, but I'm, I'm not giving you straw anymore. You've got to find your own straw. And by the way, if you don't make the quota of bricks, I'm going to beat you to death. What does their God do when they grumble against God, Yahweh, the one who's already delivered them? He hears their grumbling, and then he provides for their need. Verse 13, and in the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, fine as frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? I'm going to pause here because there's a little wordplay here we can't see in English, because in Hebrew, that phrase, what is it, is one word, manna. I think that's funny. They went out and said, manna, what is it? That became its name, and they ate it for 40 years. For they did not know what it was, and Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. You shall take each an omer, which is about half gallon or a little bit more, according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the people of Israel did so. They gathered some more, some less, but when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as he could eat. They shared. So the Lord provides meat in the evening, man in the morning. But notice, he gives them exactly what they need each and every day. No more, no less. Except on the sixth day, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Why did he do it this way? Why didn't he just like, give them a month at a time? It seemed like that would have been a little more efficient. That when they, they wouldn't have had to collect it every single day. Why didn't they just, he just deposit it directly into their bodies? He's God, right? He could do that. He has the technology. They wake up in the morning, they're hungry. Oh, no, I'm not hungry anymore. He wants them to gather it every single day. In Deuteronomy 8, Moses is at the end of his life. He's looking back on this part of the story. Here's what he says. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna to teach you, listen, that man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Does that ring a bell with you? In Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus is led into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, to turn stones into bread, he says man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. In the Lord's Prayer, when he taught us to pray, he said, give us this day our daily bread. See, manna in this part of the Bible is a metaphor for the word of God, that which feeds us and sustains us with truth, with reminding us who God is and who we are, that nourishes us along the way. And the manna points us to Christ himself. In the passage Steve read for us moments ago, John chapter 6, they're questioning Jesus. They say, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never 
thirst. The Bible is telling us that Jesus is the Word of God made flesh. As such, He is the bread of life. He is the, that which sustains us and gives us strength. His Word is available to us, but we have to gather the manna every day to survive in the wilderness. So if you ask yourself, how often do you nourish your soul from God's Word? Maybe it's once a month by coming to worship services. You hear someone preach the word, you're nourished. That's not enough to survive in the wilderness. Maybe it's once a week. That's good, but that's not enough to survive in the wilderness. He provides it every day, but we have to gather it. If we don't gather every day, we perish in the wilderness. So God provides in his grace. But thirdly, we see that the people, the people distrust. They distrust. When our boys were very young, one of them developed a, 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 an inordinate fondness for chocolate milk. And I've told this story before. Loved chocolate milk, the kind you could make with Nestle's Quick. And he liked it so much, we had to put a limit on the consumption of chocolate milk. Now, no, today, elite athletes drink chocolate milk like it's a training drink. I, who knew then, right? So we put a limit on the chocolate milk. One glass per boy per morning. Seemed reasonable. Everybody knew the limit. And either I would get it for them or they could get it themselves when they're old enough. So one morning I'm having my quiet time in my office, whatever, my studying, and uh, my little four-year-old, five-year-old comes trotting in. He says, Daddy, can I have some chocolate milk? It's like 6 o'clock in the morning. And I've been happy to give him chocolate milk. But I looked at him and I could see the little chocolate milk mustache <laughs> telltale. And see, he knew the limit. He trusted me to provide, but not that much. So he provided for himself. So we had a little conversation about the chocolate milk thing after that. Look at Exodus 16. And Moses said to them, let no one leave any of it over till morning. So he's saying, I'm going to, God's going to provide every day. But don't save any for tomorrow, because I'm going to give you more tomorrow. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. So you see what's happening? God promises to provide. I'm going to show you who I am. I'm going to provide bread for you every morning. But don't save it for tomorrow because I'm going to give you more tomorrow. What do the people do? They try to hoard it because they don't really trust his provision. Verse 22, on the sixth day, they gathered twice as much bread, two omers each. And when all the leaders of the congregation came and told Moses, he said to them, this is what the Lord has commanded. Tomorrow is a day of solemn rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake and boil what you will boil. And all that is left over lay aside to be kept till the morning. So they laid it aside till the morning, as Moses commanded them, and it did not stink, and there were no worms in it. Moses said, eat it today, for today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, which is a Sabbath, there will be none. See what God's doing here? I'm going to give you enough, to, enough for every day, except the sixth day I'll give you twice as much. Then you can save it for the next day, because that's the Sabbath. I don't want you looking for bread on the Sabbath. What do the people do? The very next verse. And on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they found none. They went out to gather. Why? They didn't really trust the provision. They wanted to get more. They still hadn't learned. Verse 28. And then the Lord said to Moses, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? In other words, how long until you trust my provision? See, the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he gives you bread for two days. Remain each of you in his place. Let no one go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. Now, what do we make of this wild, ancient story? Jeff said last week that this story of the Exodus in the book of Exodus is the very center of the Old Testament. That we can't understand the whole Old Testament without understanding this story. And I would add to that this story points us to the very center of the New Testament. It's why we need to learn it and understand it, because it drives us to the New Testament, because it's all about salvation. It's all about God's deliverance. It's the epic story of God coming to the rescue. So what do we learn in this ancient story about salvation? Three things that are important to know. First, just as God's people needed saving from Pharaoh's Egypt and sometimes from themselves, so also we need saving. That without Christ, before Christ, we are in bondage, slaves to sin and death. That's what the Bible teaches. We can't save ourselves. 
Secondly, we learn that God wants to save and is able to save through his grace, through his initiative. We can't save ourselves, so he gives us his grace. We are saved by the blood of the lamb. We are saved because he delivers us from our slavery. We are no longer slaves. We are sons and daughters. And he promises to provide and lead us to a good place, a good land, the promised land. But the third thing we learn, and this is probably most important for those of us here today, it's possible to be saved, to have been delivered, and still live like a slave. It's possible. It's possible to be saved, to have been delivered through Christ, and to totally forget who you are, who we are in him. And so he takes us into the wilderness. Sometimes he allows us, and sometimes he takes us there. And the wilderness can be uncomfortable. It can be cold and lonely and difficult and painful. And we can grow hungry and we can grumble. But here's the truth. In the wilderness is where we find the manna. It's in the wilderness that he provides for us his sustenance, his strength. It's in the wilderness we learn to trust the word of God. It's in the wilderness that we learn to trust Jesus as the grace, provision, and life of God himself in the wilderness. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord, we thank you today for your great story. And sometimes we read it as if it happens to, uh, happened to an ancient people who are unlike us, who lived a zillion years ago. Help us to find ourselves in your story because we're there. For it's by your grace that we are saved. It's by your grace that you have delivered us and you've promised us your salvation. You've made us your own sons and daughters. But sometimes we find ourselves in the wilderness and we forget. We forget. Teach us that it's in the wilderness that you provide the manna, your word, your truth, your nourishment. And teach us to trust you even in the wilderness. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Oh, now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the word of God made flesh and who is the very bread of life. Amen and have a great Mother's Day.